Okay, so I want to get this out of the way first. Um, not so much because of spoiler warnings, just because I feel this strongly. Go see this movie. Go see this movie. Right now, turn off your computer, put the phone down, whatever else you've got going on, it can wait. Go see this movie. Um, Ah, I loved this movie. I loved this movie so much. Oh, man. Um, the, oh, God, this is just fabulous. It's just a really good picture, guys. Um, you're you're going to want to see it, I hope. Um, uh, so, this is becoming a new catchphrase on the show. In case you didn't know, so this is a movie, um, as far as I know, not based on a true story. It didn't say that anywhere in the... Uh, in the thing, so it's, I'm assuming this is an all fictionalized story, but what it is, is it's this young lady, young Welsh girl, um, during the Blitz of London, um, when the Ministry of Defense and all that were looking for propaganda films, and they wanted, you know, to kind of lift the country up, and through circumstances she gets hired to basically write the female dialogue, they want to appeal to the females in the crowd and so this whole story is her and this other guy basically making this propaganda film and there's little threads in there about you know a love story between them and you know the loss of war and all the stuff you'd expect from a world a world war ii movie but um it's all just so fabulous it's all just done so well um I'm going to admit right off that I'm probably the easiest get for a film like this. Not just because I really have an affection for not, uh, I don't know how to say this. Um, I'm very interested in that time period, in that late 30s, early 40s, that world, that whole World War II era just comes from, you know, the way I was raised. So I want to have affection for that. Two, um, I love movies from that time period. Those are so that's like one of my favorite time periods for films. So it's a movie about making a movie in the 1940s, and like they do these things where, you know, like when she's writing it, they do that kind of old screenwriter thing where she sees it in her mind, she sees the movie, and they shoot it and color it and act like people did in the 1940s. It was just so freaking cool. So much so that you really, <laughs> kind of like a lot of movies that are about making movies, by the end of it, you kind of want to see the whole picture. You want to see the movie they've been making this whole time. Um, so anyway, uh, so there's that. There, It is just a really beautiful story about People. And that's another thing I love and I don't think we get enough of. You know, we're too busy with, you know, explosions and, um, uh, you know, special effects and CGI and all that nonsense that the human element of these stories gets lost. And I think that's why, I think that's why war movies and especially movies about World War II are still so important and so popular because they are stories about people. I think that's why that that time kind of has this romanticized period in our in a lot of our memories because it is it is the stories about it are stories of everyday people doing extraordinary things. Um, and this movie does that and does it in such a neat way. This idea that you know propaganda films and the the service that they provided for both sides, you know. We hear propaganda, we think we think of it in a negative term, or we think of it in a funny term. Because nowadays, propaganda films are things that you know pop up as shorts on mystery science theater and whatnot. Um, but this film really, oh, it really shows kind of the importance of it. it shows kind of the the hypocrisy of it. Because um, like, so the story they're going, they're they're trying to make for this movie, the movie within a movie, um, is about this story that was reported in the newspaper. Again, not true. This is all just in their world. Uh, these two twin sisters who during the you know the Battle of Dunkirk which ironically there's gonna be a Christopher Nolan movie about this year anyway uh, during the Battle of Dunkirk these two sisters apparently stole their their dad's fishing boat to go and you know rescue soldiers and so they send our lead 
out. I, I do not know the young lady's name, and I don't know what to call her. Um, I'm just call her, I'm going to call her very good acting Welsh lady. <laughs> um, they send her out to kind of interview the two sisters to find out what really happened, and they they end up telling her it was all a lie. You know, or not a lie, but the newspaper reported something just you know uh, that didn't actually happen. And uh, just taking that you're going to build a, pro, a film about how great it is, how great British are, you know, how they, they, the average person comes up, and you're building it off a lie right off the bat. You know, the whole thing is just very clever. Um, the performances in this are top notch. The, these are some of the best performances I've seen. And again, because they are so natural. They're funny in real ways. They're touching in real ways. They're heartfelt and comical and, you know, jerky and painful and all in very real ways, in ways you really connect with. You know, um, Bill Nighy plays this older actor who's, uh, who, you know, like, again, some of these, a lot of these characters in this film are very archetypes, very archetypal, that's not a word, but you know what I mean. Um, and Bill Nighy's character is like this older actor who, you know, isn't getting the roles he wants, and they offer him a role of like the drunk comical uncle in the film. And he he doesn't want to do it, but he kind of has to do it. Um, and through the course of the film, just to kind of get him to do what they need him to do, the, the young lady keeps punching up his dialogue and giving him better parts, making the character a fuller character. And, you know, he, he, he plays the arc so good that, you know, yeah, he is kind of a pompous and egotistical actor, but you see kind of, that's not all he is. And I think that's wonderful about a lot of the characters in this film is that you see, that's not all they are. Um, so he, he is, he's kind of that linchpin, that famous actor who kind of gets people in. Um, the young lady in this, the, the lead, I don't know her name. I don't, I, I, I haven't, I didn't have a chance to look her up on IMDb, but man, is she good. Man, is she so good in this. I, I don't have the words, you know, I've been using the same, you know, subtle and uh, understated and all. I've been using the same words for every movie lately, and I don't just want to repeat myself, but I mean, she is so good in this. So I don't know what she's done before. Uh, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna feel real stupid if I look her up and she's done like all these other movies I've seen. Um, but she really, she is that moral center of the film. That you know, she's our hero, and uh, she she carries it really well. Um, the guy I, again, I don't know his name right off the top of my head, but the guy who played uh, Will Trainer in uh, Me Before You, the, the the young man in the wheelchair, is the other lead. He plays the kind of more experienced screenwriter. He's kind of a jerk. Um, what's funny and what, what's good is that in a lot of ways the movies avoid some of the pitfalls that films like this tend to fall into. Um, and other times it walks right into them. Um, so this guy's kind of a jerk and he's snarky and all that. But he's not snarky to her because she's a woman. You know, they kind of have that, uh, that running under the the course of the film it's like subtext they get to it but it's not the whole story it's not a i think it's a female empowerment film done right where you don't feel like you're just being told the same thing or just had someone on a soapbox yelling at you instead of what or that every guy in the room is just tr doesn't respect her or you know think she's just the little woman and the way the guys around her are portrayed is that they all like her, and, they, and she wins them over by being good at what she does. You know, and I think that's more effective than just having, you know, Joe C. Woman Hater over in the corner going, bah, 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 woman can't write, bah, 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 bah. you know, you know, and her, I'll show you, sir. You know, I think, you know, I think they did a really good job with that. Um, Jeremy Irons is in this for like 10 seconds. He has a, he has a cameo, which is, you're just like, where, why, why couldn't we have Jeremy Irons in it more? It's because it's Jeremy Irons, but still. Um, so the cast as a whole really holds up. And again, I'm, I'm so easy for films like this, because again, it's a lot of, you know, how they made movies like that, using miniatures, 
and you know they uh, they sh they keep showing how um, the Ministry of Defense or whatever it was kept interfering in the film and saying, okay, um, in the original script they had the boat that the girls were taking to rescue the guys break down, and then they said, well, the Department of Transportation doesn't want that because they don't want it to sound like Britain makes inferior. Uh, inferior propellers. Okay, you know, great. So we'll have it get tangled up in some garbage or something. Uh, and then they're like, well, we want this We want this to also be a rallying cry for Americans. So we got to get an American in here. So they find some war hero who can't act. You know? <laughs> um, and, you know, they're, they're trying to teach him to act and they figure out oh, we're going to dub his voice over. So they do all these tricks where he's hiding his mouth while he's talking so they can do the dubbing. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's really clever, and if, and if you watched enough, you know, older movies, if you're like me and you're a child of the Turner Classic Movie Channel, um, you see all the things in all these movies you see, you know, and you're just like, it's like a love letter to that time, and that time of filmmaking, and it's beautifully done. Um, perfect? No? Uh, a couple things about it that I think, uh, um... I think for, okay, this is going to work. So about halfway through the film, I'm sitting there going, man, I don't want this movie to end yet. Because they were get, I, th I thought they were getting towards the part of, you know, them wrapping up the movie within a movie. So you're like, okay, so that's going to be kind of climax. And I'm like, man, I don't want the movie to end. You know, I really like the characters. I really like the situation. I really like all of it. It's really great. I don't want it. I, I don't want to go yet. And then the movie didn't end. And then it continued not to end. I think it's funny for a film that kept, the, there's this line that the snarky writer kept saying to the, to the young lady, you know, she'd write something, she'd hand it to him, and he'd go, too long, cut half of it. And she'd say, which half? And he said, the half you don't need. You know, it's kind of a running running gag. And I, I think for a film that had that at least twice, I think they could have listened to that advice a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe cut a little bit here and there. I I think towards the end, um, the love story veers into melodrama. You know, the the, the love story rears into that that area of really, you know, now this, which could be a, a, an example of life imitating art kind of thing, especially since those movies they were working on veered into melodrama a lot. But still, it didn't feel right. Um, there's one thing, um, I want to phrase this correctly. So one of the characters they had in the film was a, a, another woman, and she also worked at the ministry, she was like a liaison, and, uh, this character was a lesbian. And they let this character go, let this character go, let this character go, and... They finally reveal she's a lesbian in this tiny little line that, you know, when Bill Nighy is giving acting lessons to the handsome American, and this this woman leans over to him and goes, you know, if one was younger and so inclined, they would find him very attractive. And I thought that was perfect. You know, you didn't need, I thought that line was perfect. It's like, okay, the audience gets it. We all get it. You know, but from that line on, it seemed like they did everything to make sure you knew this character was a lesbian. You know, every kind of cliche. You know, suddenly she went from dressing, you know, I, again, I don't, I, I'm using the wrong vocabulary, so please don't misunderstand. Went from dressing like, like a woman, quote unquote to now wearing pants and ties, you know, dressing more masculine, let's say. And uh, they started putting in little bits, like they're all doing a, a singing a singing around the piano at one of the pubs after they got done filming, and the handsome American like just puts an arm on her shoulder, just as like, a, you know, a pat, and she like jerks away, like, ugh, ugh. And I thought from that, from the moment she said that line, which it's like, I think they ruined the character. You know, because they made it too much. They put it too much up there instead of just letting it be a line and letting us go, okay, she's a lesbian. You know, maybe I'm going to get in trouble from people for saying this, 
but you know, not all lesbians dress like men or want to dress in a more masculine way. You know, I think that is a stereotypical shorthand that is not untrue for some, if that's what makes them comfortable, but it's not true of all of them. And I think they went, it was just something that really bugged me as the film went on. I also got to say, I do not like the title of the song. I love this movie, do not like the title. You know, Their Finest. And apparently it's based on a book with a much better title. It's like, Their Finest Hour and a Half. Which now I need to find this book, because I want to read this. Um, but, it, I, I don't, they should have named the title Their Finest Hour and a Half, in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, not perfect. Not a perfect movie. But, damn is it good. Damn is it good. Oh, my God. And here's the funny part. This is what I, I found um, really stirring. Um, at the end of, so at the end of the film, um, the young lady goes and sees the film within a film. And they're just showing clips from it and showing people's reactions. And through the goofiness of, you know, the, the film, even through but you can see its earnestness, and from the reactions of the people watching it, I ain't gonna lie, I got a little teared up. It was, I, I wasn't expecting it, but there were some moments watching the movie within a movie when you're just like, you know, you, it's like, that's, that's amazing to me that the film did that. You know, I don't know how they did it or why, but it was so, it, 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 when those lights came up, I felt good. I feel, you know, and that, that's kind of, in a sense, that's what the, feel, the feeling they were going for with the, you know, with the, with the propaganda film, you know, again, art and having life, but I, I left feeling, feeling good, not just good, and that's, it's a feel-good story, and things, you know, you know, things really put together, but good in the fact that, just thinking, that is what a good movie really is, that is what a really well-made, well-written, well-directed, well-acted movie really is. And uh, I said this once already this year. I'm going to say it again, though. If the movie... If, I'm not the movie. If, this, if the year ended right now, if this was December, and this was the last movie I saw, this would be my best picture of the year. And... It's going to take a lot for a film to knock this out. But it's going to have to be something pretty spectacular to knock this off of the top shelf for me. This one is problems and all. This is one I, I really want to buy. I really want to keep in my regular rotation. I want to watch it a lot because I just like the I like the characters. I like the setting. I like I like everything about it. It. You know, it is, it's a well-made film, and I, I implore you, I implore you and beg you that if you love movies, if you're a fan of old movies, you just like good stories about characters, anything like that, you need to go see this movie right frickin' now. Their finest, go find it, hopefully it's playing somewhere near you. You know, and you can go and experience this. I don't want to oversell it because you know what I always find when people oversell me on things. I go and see them and go, oh, that was it. But I really love this movie, guys. I I I'm in love with this film. So, um, big big thumbs up from me on their finest. Um, they could do something with the title though. Anyway, uh, so thanks for watching, and go see this movie. And next week. Matt and I are going to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, so we're going from really well-made picture to all right, popcorn, candy, and space operas, baby. Talking raccoons. So um, so have a good week. I will hopefully have a good weekend. Uh, drive safe, and I will see you at the movies.